All right, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. My name is Jenny Conroy, and I'm the president of the Board of Trustees, and we have the rest of the board here, and Joy walking in, as well as some members of the Finance Committee for our financial forum this morning. So before we have our opening reading and get started, I wanna just give you a little overview of our handouts and our agenda. So as you came in, there was a draft of the budget that we are going to go over, as well as the foundation report and some F the FAQs that we prepared after the recent town halls. I wanted to note that those, we only printed about 50 copies of those because they're pretty long. So those are also on the website, fusmadison.org slash finances. And that was linked in the red floors. So you can see those online as well. And then we have our agenda that I'll go over real quick. So we're gonna have an opening reading and then we'll go over kind of an abbreviated recap of where we've been and where we are now and a, a few more data points based on some questions that came up from the town hall. Then we'll go over our proposed budget, uh, foundation update from Connie Beam, then Larry Johnson from our finance committee will talk about how we as members can be more involved. Then we'll have questions and feedback. And then we'll have our closing. Also, I want to point out on the back of the agenda is our relational covenant. Just as a reminder, as we're having our discussions about how we have covenanted to speak with each other and, and bring up feedback and questions as we go. So just a reminder there. So the purpose of this is to share the proposed budget, to get your feedback, and to answer questions. And then we have our May Parish meeting, May 19th, and that's when we'll actually be voting on the budget. So no action taken today. So before we get into the meat of things, I'm going to turn it over to Kelly A.J. for our opening reading. Uh, this reading comes from Stephen Smith. Everywhere we go, we take our souls with us. And every time we meet someone, we wrap a little piece of our souls around them and pass it through them. All our lives, we weave our souls around and through everyone we meet, tying a complex, tangled web to the earth. This is who we are to the world around us. Each of us has a thousand million tendrils of other souls wrapped around us and through us, and this is who we are to ourselves. Sometimes we need to grasp these tendrils for all we're worth just to keep ourselves here. Sometimes the tendrils snap and we can't weave anymore, but the thousand, the million threads we have already woven remain tangled messily about the earth. This is still who we are, and we aren't diminished, but it does leave a hole. You have wrapped your soul around me and through me a thousand million different times. If I gather all these threads in my hands and hold tight, and if you hold on to all the threads that have ever pierced your soul, wrap them around you like a protective cloak, anchoring you to the ground, maybe the threads won't snap, and you can keep weaving a little longer. If it snaps anyway, I will take all the threads you have left me and wrap them around a spool that I will carry with me always. But try not to let your tendrils snap. I'd like to feel you weaving your soul around me and through me for a little while longer. A reminder as we begin this conversation about our congregation and about its finances, that this is one of the places where we weave our souls together. And as much or however much or however little we enjoy talking about it individually, money is a part of how we do that weaving. Okay, so we're going to do a little um, look back before we look at our budget going forward. So a reminder again of where we are, kind of how we've gotten to the position we're in over the last 10 years or so, so that then we're on a good foundation for talking about our budget for this coming year. And I know many of you are at the town hall, so a little bit of this will be recap, but we do have some new data again to share based on some of the questions that came out of those discussions. So if you wanna advance the slide. 
So again, as we're going into our next fiscal year that starts July 1st, we are projecting a budget shortfall from last year of about $200,000. And we'll talk about it in a little more detail in a moment, but over the past several years, due to the various circumstances we were in, we used some stop gaps, um, cash reserves, and government funding. So we use those well, I think, to be able to make it through those tough times, but we have exhausted those at this point. So this year we are proposing a smaller, what we think is a sustainable budget going forward so that we're not having to kind of make those stop gaps. If you wanna advance. So again, as we talked about in the town halls, we've had some compounding factors, which I know you're all familiar with, but just to remind you and kind of set the stage again, we did have a pandemic that we came through, and well, we're still living it, so we didn't completely come through it, but we've gotten through some of the worst of it, which led to our virtual services, canceled events, and then an economic recession as well. We do have ongoing high expenses. Part of that is this beautiful building we're in, this $6 million atrium that we are making great use of, but we still have those expenses to address. And then we've had record inflation, which is finally slowing down a little bit, but we had a long time of that record 10% inflation. And then kind of around the same time, we are going through this ministerial transition, a lot of upheaval with um, long-term minister Michael Schuler's retirement and three years of interim ministers. And during that time, a lot of transition, we had a loss of long-term, long-time high pledge donors. Uh, some passed away, some stepped away. So we've had all these things kind of going on in the background. If you want to go ahead and advance. And then again, as we talked about, we had some stop gaps. And some of these, it was very fortunate that we had these. First, the government assistance. Um, we had almost $500,000 of government assistance that was provided specifically so that we could maintain staff. Um, and so we used that money and we, weren't, we were able to prevent any layoffs over those years, but of course that's no longer available. Um, the ministers in Monica always are looking for grant opportunities, but those specific large pools of money are no longer available. And then cash reserves. So for about a decade, we've used cash reserves to uh, cover kind of income shortfalls or um, income kind of fluctuations over the months. But in the recent couple years, we've really used them to, to patch a ho holes in the budget. And as you may recall, in May 2023, we did vote as a congregation at that time to use 175,000 of our, our reserves uh, to balance the budget and so that we wouldn't have any layoffs at that time, though we did keep our salaries flat. So our cash reserves now are nearly depleted, so we don't have that to draw from. If you want to advance. Okay, so now a few, those slides were mostly review, but here's now just a few more to give you a little bit deeper. So at the end of December, we had uh, $309,000 in reserves. At the end of this past December, we had $86,000 in reserves. And that print might be kind of small on the bottom there, but we do have a policy to try to maintain 150,000 in cash reserves for emergencies, of course, and then again, also when there's um, fluctuations in income from month to month, if pledge payments are not coming in that month, just so we can kind of even that out. So we try to rate, maintain 150,000 and now we're down to 86,000. But we did do that, you know, we knew we were making that decision last year, but we can't make that decision again. You wanna advance? Okay, and then a few more. Last time we kind of showed you a snapshot like 10 years ago, so we wanted to give you a little more detail on some of the uh, changes over the last 10 years. So this might be a little hard to see, but this is 2013 to 2014 on the left in our pledge units over time. And it was about 800 at that time. And then way over here to the right is 22, 23. And we're just under 500 pledge units. And a pledge unit could be a household. You know, very often it's a household. Um, could be a, a one person 
So, so it's, well, it's kind of, you know, over time, 13, 14, 14, 15. So each one is a year, so this is 13, 14, 14, 15, 15, 16, 16, 17. So there's a drop there, 17, 18, then 19, then 19 20. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Okay, you want to advance to the next one? Okay, total pledge dollars over time. So this makes up the bulk of our budget is the pledge money we receive. Not all of it, but a large bulk of it. So again, this is a little hard to see on this black. It's the same time period, so it, so it starts in 1314, and then it's a year each, all the way over to 2223 on the right. And in 1314, it's just over 1.2 million. And then over here, we're just under a million. Yeah, so her comment was, even though pledge units have come down, um, the pledge, the overall pledges have stayed fairly steady. They are still, we're still about, you know, 250000 or whatever lower with also the higher inflation and higher expenses. But that leads, that does lead into our next graphic here, if you want to advance again. So our average pledge uh, has gone up over time. So... Um, here, 1314 again, 10 years of time, we were just under 1500. Oh, that's nice. Thank you. <laughs> so we were just under 1500, stayed under there, and then we've seen climbing since about 1718, and now we're over 2000. So that's a really nice sign. Um, and there are, Monica did say there, it seemed like 10 years ago there might have been a little more focus on having more pledges that might have been smaller, so sometimes that could be some of the focus might have been a little bit different at the time. So that is definitely a positive we're seeing, but our overall pledge dollars have gone down a bit. So hopefully that gives you a little more data we wanted to show you over the last 10 years. I think that that is, is that my last slide? You want to advance? Let's see. Okay. Yeah, so now, so that's again just kind of showing you where we've been and where we are now, and now we'll look at our budget. So if you want to pull out that handout, we'll look at our proposed budget. Uh, so first of all, you may take notice that I'm one person and not two. Uh, Monica Nolan, our executive director, uh, worked very long and very hard on a lot of the preparation of materials for this meeting and in organizing us, uh, and due to circumstances beyond anyone co anyone's control, she's out sick today, so I hope you'll join me in wishing her a, a, a recovery uh, and that she feels better soon. Um, so, let's speak to um, what I can speak to about the figures in front of you and on the screen. Uh, so first of all, just a reminder, uh, well, reminder for many of you, perhaps new information for some of you about how this particular draft budget was built, owing to the reality that based on our income streams and based on the way that we do budgeting here, uh, we were facing, we, uh, Monica, so like st the step-by-step -step thing is that Monica alerted Kelly Crocker and myself uh, beginning of this past fall, so sometime in early September, uh, that based on the projections for what the final um, cost of quarter four of our previous fiscal year would be, we would have even less uh, money in our cash reserves than was originally planned and expected, and given 
that, we would be needing to cut somewhere on the order of what turned out to be a little over $200,000 $200, out of this coming year's budget relative to last, the last budget, the current budget for the current fiscal year that the congregation approved in May. That, that would need to be the change if we were going to present a balanced budget to the congregation. So Kelly and I, recognizing that was going to be a big undertaking with significant consequences for how we operate together, started with the question of, okay, if we have to basically start over from scratch, rebuild the institution in terms of our understanding of its priorities, where do we do that from? Um, so what you will see in the details of the, uh, you've got a handout there, there's details as well on the screen, is that uh, of that number, or rough, it's a little bit more than 200,000, we were able to account for about a quarter of it, just slightly less than a quarter of it, uh, in programmatic expenses. That is, expenses that are just about the way that we do business. Things related to the facilities, things related to the cost of our individual programs. That is not where the bulk of the money that it takes in order to run this institution comes from, or goes to, rather. The bulk of our expenses are human expenses. They are the costs necessary to employ our staff. And so roughly three quarters of those cuts then needed to come from, uh, from our existing staff team, uh, very sadly. That's, so we were happy to be able to find about a quarter of what we needed in the program thing. It's not that there are some cuts there that I wouldn't say I'm excited about, but I believe we can keep um, we can keep everything running essentially, uh, you know, just sort of working a little bit smarter. Um, there's things like changing our uh, changing the um, company that we rely on for our payroll services. Right, it's shifting things in order to uh, save money where we could, but the bulk of them did necessarily have to come out of uh, human resources there. Uh, so, that the budget was built by Kelly and I putting our heads together thinking, okay, this is what we think we can as the people who are in charge of leading the staff team, what we think we can do the core work of the congregation as we understand it. This is the team that we think we can operate with given the budget constraints. We then went to the board with what we thought we could work with. We got feedback from the board that guided uh, us in putting together some changes in that plan, um, both some new ideas and also some parameters, some guidance from them about, well, this is where we think the priorities of the institution are, necessarily important information to have. Uh, and then, we took that plan created in consensus with the board, we came to a, a place of agreement with them, and took it back to Monica Nolan, our executive director, because she is our primary numbers person. So she needed, I mean, we needed her to sharpen the pencil and see, is there anything that we missed? Is there anything else that we can provide in terms of savings? And actually some of the key programmatic uh, changes that allowed us to retain as many staff members as we were able to came from her, so I want to credit her uh, for that. So, then we took it to you. That's, that's what the round of town halls that happened in January were about. That's what this is now. We are, this is the, what you have in your hand is the budget that as of right now, your board intends to present to the congregation uh, for a vote in May. Reminder, that's when the vote is. So, um, this is, you are, though this is, this is sort of the, difference about this year is that this would usually be the day on which or the weekend on which this document would be public. It was um, promulgated to the congregation a little bit earlier than usual because we recognize it's a big set of changes. So I want to say a little bit of something about income just to make sure that we're playing with the same information here. Uh, the, on the income side, our sources of income as a congregation are first and foremost our pledges. The financial support pledged to the institution by our members and friends is where the bulk of our income, the bulk of the resources that we have to share together come from. 
The second uh, source on this is our relationships with our renters, primarily our long-term renters. We do see a small amount of income from one-off events or cyclical annual events, but the vast majority of our rental income comes from three consistent sources. The Meeting House Nursery School, which is a long-time rental relationship we have and which makes use of much of our facility during the weekdays. Uh, Congregation Shrey Shemayim, uh, a newer but still long-term rental relationship that makes uh, use of the building many Saturdays, some other times during the week, and also uh, they rent office space from us in the Isom House, so that's another ongoing daily expense, or, uh, well, expense to them, income to us. And then our parking uh, clients, who are mostly on annual uh, and sometimes multi-year uh, agreements for the use of spaces in our parking lot, another major source of revenue for the congregation. Uh, the third source of income I would point out and lift up uh, is the annual contribution from our foundation, the investment income that has been, well, sorry, in, the foundation accounts for donations that have been made for long-term value to the congregation, they go to the foundation, the foundation invests that income and uh, sends a payment to the congregation each year to help to underwrite the cost of the annual budget. So that's another major source of revenue for us. And then other smaller but still important resources that I just wanna make sure we're all aware of, uh, the annual or the, the yearly um, sources of individual contribution that are not pledges. So contributions made to the outreach offering each weekend. Most weekends the outreach offering is a shared offering, part, half to one uh, beneficiary in the larger community, half to FUS. Occasionally the entire plate goes to the, the uh, recipient. Um, that's usually for a specific reason. Uh, Unpledged income, which is uh, various reasons, but probably the single most common reason why we receive unpledged income is when someone new joins the congregation and wants to make a contribution but doesn't have an existing pledge from the current year's uh, pledge campaign. And then money raised through fundraising events. Um, most of our events that do raise funds here at FUS are actually fun Raisers, that's the way in which they, we, appro we approach them, and it's also the level at which they contribute. So they can, the, their primary purpose is in connecting the community and building rapport and relationship, but they can also generate some revenue. Uh, and then there's, there's really just one that I can name as being a really significant source of income, and that's the annual Art in the Right Place uh, fundraiser. That, uh, other ones often turn a profit, but that is the one that most consistently turns a, a sort of a measurable profit. Um, and then the, the sort of final source that I would name, and it's not really a thing that makes a difference in the budget, but it is important to acknowledge as a thing that's involved in our financial life, is that we do charge fees for certain classes and other uh, programmatic events. And those really go to underwrite the costs of the classes themselves, but they are defraying something that would otherwise have to come out of the annual budget. Uh, so, in terms of transitioning now to expenses, uh, like income, in general, we budget our expenses based on a two-year average of spending. This is what I was speaking about before when I said the because of the way that we have historically done and continue to do our budgeting process here at FUS, uh, a lot of these numbers, although not all predictable multiple years in advance, are pretty well prescribed for us. This, uh, because they are based on this two-year average of both income and expenses. The benefit of that is that it insulates us about against individual hardship. One-year downturns, we feel much lighter impact from. But the drawback of it is that it's much slower to turn the boat. So that is essentially the reason why the ability to just sort of jerk the wheel and shift the financial reality of the congregation isn't open to us in the way that 
some smaller congregations are used to things operating. I mean, just again, to be candid, I've said this before, I am used to it functioning differently in smaller institutions that aren't dealing with the size and scale that we do as a community. Uh, so as I said, the largest single segment of our, of our expenses are our human expenses, the compensation we pay to our staff team. Uh, so if you can advance the slide, so this was shared with the congregation in January. You may have seen it, you may not have, but this is the intended organizational chart for the budget as it is being presented from the board to the congregation. So if, the, if that budget or something very similar to it passes in May, this is the arrangement of staff that you will see going forward uh, in our next fiscal year. Um, just to make sure everybody, you know, I know not everybody can necessarily see or read it easily. Um, as always, there's no change in the role of the authority of the Board of Trustees. The Board of Trustees acts on behalf of the congregation in between its parish meetings and sets the policy that the staff is required to follow in the way that it does its job and its work. Kelly and I, as your co-senior ministers, that's the next level down on the chart, uh, are responsible for managing the staff team and ensuring that the policies passed by the Board of Trustees are followed by the staff in their work. The next level down in this organizational chart will be five co-equal directors. Three of those positions are full-time, two of those positions will be half-time. The two half-time positions, Director of Stewardship and Director of Music, the three full-time positions, Director of Lifespan Education, Director of Membership, Director of Finance and Operations. All five of those positions exist at some level in our current organizational chart. Um, the exact relationship of those positions has been ambiguous and um, not, necessarily, uh, not necessarily intended to be even. And so one of the, it's not really a, it's not, a choice related directly to the financial considerations. It's a choice more out of trying to organize the staff in what we consider to be both a more coherent way and a way that does more to encourage cooperation across different programs and throughout different parts of the organization to say, these five people all will have the title director, not all of them did previously, and will all be intentionally placed on the same footing structurally. And then there are additional roles beyond the five director level positions, some of which are full-time, some of which are part-time. The one Possibly the position that has the absolute least amount of change involved in this plan is our facilities manager because we have a sprawling campus, right? We have a, 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 a set of buildings um, that both provide us great benefit, both through the use of the congregation in terms of the income from them, and also incur substantial costs and, and needs related to maintaining and protecting the congregation's real estate assets. So having a full-time facilities manager doing essentially the same job next year as he's doing this year felt integral to that. Uh, there are several part-time positions. The basic expectations and um, uh, role of will not be changing in this plan. Our child care workers, our assistant music director, our child and teen choir director and our AV and event specialist. Those are all roles that we have in our current organizational chart. They continue into the next organizational chart. Um, mm, uh, yes, and then there is one position on this list that is new. It is one new full-time position in making some cuts. I'm gonna to speak to the cuts in a second, just as a reminder. Uh, in making some cuts to staff, cuts we did not want to make but did not feel we had a choice, we did identify that there was an area that was already uh, a, a weak point for our organization and a weak point in terms of the needs of our staff team in order to do their job and would only get weaker if not addressed. So while we had to present to the board a budget that required uh, reducing our total number of staff, it also included increasing by one 
new member, one new staff position, and that's the office assistant position to have one person whose core responsibilities focus on the organizational needs of just functioning in an office environment and in particular our databases. Uh, we have well over a thousand adult members here and many, many more folks in our listings in terms of the friends, visitors, other people that, whose information we need to keep track of both for financial reasons and in order to uh, serve the needs of the community. Um, and having a person whose job it was to actually focus on that felt like an unavoidable need. So that's the reason for that new position. Uh, I've said this before, but just as a reminder, or again for anyone for whom this is news, there are three positions that very sadly will be going away entirely in this budget. Uh, those are Zan Hendricks, who is our program assistant. It's about 80% religious education, or excuse me, uh, children's religious exploration, and about 20% membership and adult programming support role. Um, the social justice coordinator, Christy Sprague, whose focus is on our social justice programming, and Molly Bacchus, our communications professional. Those are the three positions that will be going away entirely in this, and as is pointed out on this org chart, two positions that are currently full-time will be going to halftime. Our music director, Drew Collins, that's the same title. Um, we will, I will be working with him, uh, we have a plan in we have a plan in principle. We have not written out into a detailed format yet for which responsibilities will be going away or moving to other staff members so that it can be a truly half-time position, so that I'm not asking him to do more work for less pay. And uh, what is currently our program manager position the title change will be to the director of stewardship. Um, a large part of the thinking in moving that position to half time, I mean, I'm not excited about any of these changes, but the reason in thinking that that is possible is that much of the database role that that position has been handling mostly by default, not really by original design, will now be intentionally kept with the office assistant position. That's your walkthrough on the organizational chart. Um, there's one more thing I want to make sure to highlight in terms, of uh, in terms of changes to expenses, right? Most of this is about numbers going down, but there is at least one key area where a number is going up, and that is, if you look, it's near the bottom, I believe, of the handout. Let me get that in front of me. Uh, yes, the number is highlighted in yellow. Uh, under expenses, partial replenishment of cash reserve. We've talked a little bit about why the cash reserves have been going down um, with some replenishment, mostly from government funding over the last 10 years, as we've been using them to fund budgets that were, I think, I think they were good budgets. I have no criticism of those budgets. They simply were beyond the means of our immediate sources of income, and now we have to restructure to live within the means of our annual sources of income. Uh, we talked about why those numbers have gone down, but the cash reserves, in addition to serving essentially as a uh, rainy day fund for the congregation, that's one role it has and can play, also serves a kind of a, a process function. We have a budget that is largely, not entirely, but more than half, shaped by the pledges that we receive from our membership, and then the contributions that members make in fulfillment of those pledges. And members can make those contributions at any time during the fiscal year. Some folks have things set up with their bank on a regimented system. We're very grateful to those of you who do that, but we're also grateful to the people who pay as they can and make individual choices based on their family budgets about when is the right time in the year to pay. There isn't a wrong way to make your contribution and all of it's appreciated. But because people can pay at any time, uh, that can lead to a erratic cash flow for the organization. And so the other function that cash reserves serve is to basically help us even out the cash flow, 
right? It basically functions like a checking account for the congregation. You keep a certain amount of money in it just to make sure that uh, if a bill hits before the, mo the next coming payment does, there isn't a problem with cash flow. So there is a, a need, even if not to serve as a rainy day fund, to replenish cash reserves at least to a small degree. And that's that uh, number there, I believe it is, for, a little over 14 grand. There you go. All right, thank you, Kelly. And next we are gonna get an update on our foundation from Connie Beam. And we get a annual update on the foundation. We thought it would be a good idea to give this now both because there's been some questions on sort of the interaction of how funding from the foundation comes and why it's great to keep building up the foundation because we are getting almost 200,000 this year. And then also the ways in which you can donate to the foundation and kind of how that works. So Connie is gonna take us through the foundation report. Thank you, Jenny. And um, very nice explanation on the budget, <laughs> Kelly. That was, that was well done. Well, um, I'm glad to be here this morning, and I see um, if you're a member of the foundation board, would you raise your hand? So there's Carol, Kathy, David, and uh, Peter over there. I don't think I missed anybody else. There's nine of us, and we are all elected by you, by the congregation, and you will vote on three new members or returning members at our parish meeting in May. Um, so our, our foundation, as I think a lot of you know, has been around a long time. This congregation instituted this separate nonprofit corporation to uh, make long-term investments for and behalf of the, the society. Um, and what we do every year is we look at our total assets on December 31st. And we look, take 5% of that and we hand it over to the church for the next fiscal year. And we've been doing that now for many, many years. And this report, uh, you can see our, we've got our income activities, uh, our income expenses, our total assets and liabilities listed um, for the last two years. You can see that at the end of our last fiscal year, which actually we have the same fiscal year as the church, so that fiscal uh, 23 is now last year, last June. Um, so it's almost a year old. Uh, but at that time we had 3.4 million, almost 3.5 million dollars in total assets. And then the little chart to the right shows you how the assets have grown over the years um, from 2014 right up to 2023. And then the chart below that shows you what our return on investment is. And it's kind of up and down and up and down as the market is because we do invest this money. And uh, you can see that <laughs> you can see that real pop in 2021 where the market went crazy and then it collapsed in 2022. And in 23 now we've recovered a little bit from that uh, crazy market time. And so... What we do is we average, we look at the last three years of total assets on December 31st, and we average those. And then we take 5% of that average and distribute it back to FUS on a quarterly basis. And so that kind of evens out, like Kelly was referring to. What was the term you used, Kelly? It, it, because we use this averaging uh, method, it turns the ship slowly instead of this up and down and up and down. It smooths out our distributions over time to FUS. So they'll have some sense of what the annual distribution is going to be. It isn't going to bounce around. Now, it wasn't always like that. If you look at um, annual distribution chart 2015, see how that pops up there? Well, that was the last year. We had two of our largest funds distributed on a different distribution system. It, it provided up to 80% of the previous year's earnings of that fund. So in a good year, you got a lot of money, and in a bad year, you got a lot less money. And so we fixed that, we changed that with the approval of the Board of Trustees, and now you can see that our payments have evened out a little better, even though the market hops all over the place. 
Um, and then in the bottom left, there's a little story there about Bill and Joyce Wartman. Bill and Joyce were members, of, well, Bill was. I don't know if Joyce was a member or not. But anyway, Bill was no, <laughs> I'm seeing no. <laughs> uh, Bill was a member here for many, many years. And when he passed, or even before he passed, he, uh, back in the 90s, he and Joyce uh, set up some funds with us and permanently endowed those funds. And the music fund is just one of those. There's three that they established. And over the years, they continued to cr contribute to that fund. The, the uh, congregation contributed some matching money. And individuals have contributed to that uh, fund as well over the years. And now, uh, as you can see, the, the fund is worth 100, over $163,000. It provides a substantial amount of money every year to the, to the music fund. And all of our funds work that way. There's some real little ones that started out with just $1,700, and now they're worth nearly 40. And they pay out a nice sum to whatever purpose they are intended for. So our, our distributions support uh, the, the budget. In almost every area, we've got social justice funds, we have music funds, we have undesignated, unrestricted funds, so the board is free to put it wherever it feels it needs to. We have a building, huge building fund, we have program fund, um, many, all of these funds really help, and over time, it really makes a big difference. So, um, bringing us up to date, I'll just add this one little ditty. In last November, we were notified that we will be receiving, the foundation will be receiving a very substantial gift, the largest gift we've ever received from the Betty Bamforth estate. Betty was a member here for many years. She died relatively young, um, but she left her estate to uh, benefit her sister. And when her sister passed away, which was just last summer, then the estate is now distributing to five beneficiaries, and we are one of them. And we will receive some t somewhere in the neighborhood of eight hundred and fifty or nine hundred thousand dollars. She designated it for building maintenance and endowment, so it has to come to the foundation. But we will put that money to work, and we will help to uh, add to the distribution we make every year for maintaining uh, this building and our campus. So just another little story of how people can make a big difference over a long amount of time. So um, if, are we taking questions or? Okay. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Connie. And like Kelly said, we have one more topic and then we'll open it up to questions and feedback. So Larry is going to talk about, you know, as members, what this means for us if we're having a bit of a contraction as members, what, what do we need to do to uh, contribute? Thank you. Thank you. And I, can you hear me? Okay. And I'm going to sit here and, and instead of standing, I hope you can still see me. Um, no, I, I, actually, I have some uh, nerve damage in my feet, and so I have a balance problem. So if I stand up, I'm going to fall over. So I, I think I'll just stand up. <laughs> okay. Well, since I'm representing the Finance Committee, you probably think I'm going to talk about money, <laughs> right? Actually, I'm going to expand our discussion and talk about wealth. Uh, today, we've talked about our financial resources, but money is just part of our wealth. In addition to our financial gifts, we also have a wealth of natural resources uh, that we're using right now. And, uh, for example, we make money with our resources here, and Kelly has talked about that, uh, renting the parking lot, uh, renting out our space here for events and for the Jewish congregation and the child care center and $280,000 is pretty significant. Uh, also, we save money with our facility. We have solar panels on the roof, and we're using our groundwater beneath us as part of our heat pump system, so we're saving money. But what is often overlooked is our wealth of human resources, people. Human creativity and our time and labor are a powerful combination for service to each other, to FUS, and to our community. 
When we think about it, our members have abundant skills, talents, and abilities such as teachers, plumbers, children, lawyers, carpenters, mothers, computer experts, farmers, child care workers, accountants, artists, musicians, teenagers, social workers, storytellers, fathers, physical and mental health providers, entertainers, government service employees, consultants, lawn maintenance pros, advocates, waiters, lecturers, connections with resource people, managers, elders, and more. We could go on. We have much to share. The point I want to make is that the wealth of FUS in its many forms can be used to promote and sustain our mission and our value, our mission and our, our vision. So I encourage us all to find lots of ways to share our vast wealth with each other. Thank you so much, Larry. That was such a good reminder and good kind of recognition of the, the part we all play. So before we move on, our next steps here are that we're going to take your feedback, your questions, hear from you, and then the board will have a couple more meetings before our May parish meeting when we'll present our proposed budget for voting on then in May. That will then begin in July 1st. So now we can take your questions, and Mike is going to be... Matt, it's going to be passing the mic. Hi. Uh, my, name is, my name is Vicki Jones. I've been a member here for 35 years. Um, I appreciate how difficult this task has been for everybody, and thank you for all the hard work that you're doing. I know that the focus of this meeting is about sustainability, but kind of the yang to that yin is growth. And I'm wondering, um, I, and I believe that two of the program areas that are most successful in attracting potential new members are our RE and music programs, where we are seeing some significant cuts. And I'm wondering what kind of conversations you've been having about how to foster and stimulate growth and attract new potential members as you've been thinking about this? I can start that a little bit. I, I don't think we mentioned it now, but at the town halls, we talked about two membership teams, two ministry teams that will be starting up, membership and stewardship. Um, and so those are two ways that you know we want to not just rely on staff, but see how members can can help in that area to think about ways to grow our membership, grow our engagement. Um, so those are two ways. I, I do think it's going to take a lot of us kind of contributing and not being as dependent on, on staff. Did anyone else want to add anything on that one? Uh, just a quick comment. Um, we do get quite a few visitors here every week and uh, our, relig our uh, new member classes are, I think, full for the most part. Um, but I think uh, focusing on new members is really, you know, something that we want to do. So I want to offer just a, maybe a different framework perspective on it. Uh, it seems like you're sort of asking, like, what, what is happening organizationally around, uh, around this? So I think it's an incredibly important thing to be continuously open, and, open to and welcoming to new members for reasons utterly divorced from finances, right? And that, that is the primary reason why we do, I think, everything that we do, with the possible exception of, like, renting things out. I mean, I think maybe the, the rental value is, is maybe a little bit more dollars and cents focused. But everything else we do as a congregation, first and foremost, is guided by things that aren't money. Money is necessary and important to consider. It is not the primary driving factor in why we make, in my, to my understanding, almost all of our key decisions. And I, I just want to, like, in terms of making sure that people have an awareness of this piece of information, right, we, uh, every congregation in the Unitarian Universalist Association is 
asked, not everybody does it, but almost everybody does it, to turn in certain facts and figures, data points about their congregation every February. It's part of our recertification process as members of the UUA. And that includes reporting our total adult membership. Uh, for this year, we just reported at the beginning of February, and so did everybody else, so that's a point where we can compare and say, okay, here's where we are. Uh, we are the second largest brick and mortar Unitarian Universalist congregation in the country. I think we've been there before. We had, oh, you know, I don't know that it matters if we're big or not. Like, I'm just, I'm just going to say, like, I don't, I don't think it's inherently good or bad. It simply is. Like, it's a thing to know about ourselves. We are the second largest by adult membership. That's a, it's a piece of information to have. So we see a lot of, that's because we see a lot of visitors. We see a lot of newcomers. We're absorbing a I think, pretty respectable number of those newcomers uh, each year, because we just hit 1190 is the figure we reported, and that's an objectively large group of people for a congregation. Um, but I, I do, I want to put in the, like, the voice for the th reasons why we need to be thinking about how we are welcoming as an institution, how we are connecting with the wider community of which we're a part, and you know, things that do have a big impact on our numerical growth as a community, the first and foremost reasons for that have nothing to do with money. And I, f I feel that very strongly, and I want to be transparent about that as my perspective. So I'm Nancy Vetter Schultz, and I just want to um, follow up to what Vicki said, because you spoke to one of the things that she wanted you to talk about. I've been a member for, I think, a year longer than Vicki. <laughs> But you didn't speak to the fact that children's religious education and music are two major draws to our congregation, and whether you thought about how that works with respect to the budget you just gave us. So indeed we did, at least in so far as we thought a lot about what, what do we understand the crucial functions of the congregation to be? And then what, is, uh, what material resources do we need in order to meet that kind of baseline, right? So it is the case that the total amount being uh, contributed, to, being spent on the uh, music program is going down in this budget. Uh, that the total amount being spent on the children's religious exploration program is going down in this budget. Um, I would highlight that it's, that's more than just across the board, and depending on how you want to, I mean, you, we could have a whole debate about what's the most important thing. Is it dollars? Is it staff hours? Um, there are other different ways to look at resource distribution, but by at least some measurements, there are other programs being more negatively impacted. I'm thinking especially about social justice, going from one full-time staff member for the whole of our social justice program to zero full-time staff members. There'll be some reapportioning of that, those work tasks to me, um, but I don't pretend that I'm going to be a substitute for Christie. That's not imaginable. Um, so there, it has impacts throughout the programmatic structure of the congregation. Uh, we believe, both based on the past experience of this congregation, what I mean, Kelly and I, as the leaders of the staff team, as the people who supervise, uh, supervise or supervise the supervisors of everybody on the staff team, we believe that the critical functions and the high quality that we are used to for both our music program and our children's religious exploration program can be met with the resource lines in this budget, or we wouldn't be proposing it, right? We would be doing something else. We would either be cutting the cake differently, or we would be having a different meeting that was about, we need you to level set to just expect fundamentally less from us programmatically in that area. That's not what I'm saying. I believe, and Kelly told me she agrees with me, you have to, you know, she's on sabbatical right now, which is why she's not here, but I, I, am, I, am, I rarely like to speak for her, but we were real solid on this, so I am speaking for her in this instance. We believe together that uh, the overall high quality uh, and robust offerings in those areas can be continued with this level of functioning. And the one other thing that I do want to highlight is there actually is a programmatic area that is seeing an increase in resources in this budget. It may or may not be transparent, and if it's not, I apologize. 
we will be going from having what is currently one person whose title is uh, the director of membership and the director of adult programs to one person whose whole title is adult is the uh, director of membership. I think that I'm uh, given to understand that was actually a title previously in other iterations of the organization, but we've been part-timing that role for several years now and going to having it be one full-time person devoted to membership and engagement and helping to helping us to together be welcoming and integrating new members and deepening our relationships together as ongoing members, uh, to my mind, is a significant and meaningful change in resources. Thank you. Um, hi, my name is Susan Koenig. I've been around less years than uh, the other people who have spoken, but still a long time. Um, uh, I believe that what I want to say connects with the idea of where our wealth lies and how we think about it. Um, as I look at this, at the, the budget, the, one of the things that caught my eye is um, in the program lines and the areas where we have underspent. And um, all of those lines make me very sad. Um, and part of the reason I wanted to comment on this is that I think it's really tempting in a time when, um, when we may feel scared about money to look at areas where we've underspent and feel really glad about that and want to celebrate that and want to encourage our staff to be um, parsimonious, to try to skimp. When I look at those lines, those look to me like plans that weren't realized. I assume that a budget that behind all of those numbers were things we intended to do and didn't get done. That there was something that people were excited about and for some reason we didn't, weren't able to pull off. Um, I know that even with our level of staffing now, people um, feel absolutely worked, overworked to the end of their level of sanity. I know that for, from firsthand experience what it's like to work here. It is crazy making to work here. I think it's better now than it was when I worked here, but it's crazy making. Um, and, and joyful, but also crazy making. Um, I want to encourage our staff, spend this money. And I want to also encourage all of us to understand that the only way we make these things happen is if we all help. And this is that moment. I know that, that um, I'm so sorry I've forgotten your name, Larry, um, and has said this and that we've seen it in print. The glass half full way to look at this is this is our moment to really live into the abundance that we have in this, in this community. I guess um, I have an observation and a question, and I'll try to be brief with each. First of all, I noticed one of the few areas of increases in the cash reserve, it's doubling almost, and I, I think this is a positive thing. Um, I don't know how different a, uh, I live in, an, in a condominium, and the rule of thumb is you want a cash reserve that is at least half the size of the annual operating budget because you don't know what could happen. Uh, you could have a burst gas or uh, water main. You could have uh, a uh, bad uh, wind or blizzard storm that uh, rips off tiles from the roof that sort of thing. Um, which leads me in my question, do you have any kind of golden rule you follow in trying to determine the proportion of your total cash reserve to the operating budget? Um, could you give us an idea of what it is if you do? Yes, um, our policy is to try to retain $150,000 in cash reserve so not half. <laughs> um, so 150,000 is what we strive to have. 
And then when it dips below 100,000 is when the executive director and the ministers alert the board. So, and I think we had, it was maybe 86,000 about right now. So we're well below, you know, our policy that we like to have. So this would get us almost to 100,000, still below, but um, get us in a position to start building that back up. Hi, I'm Rob Savage. I've been around for just about ever, and, uh, but not quite. Um, first of all, I want to say that when we first started coming here, we were out in the loggia having the coffee hour, and who do you talk to? You talk to your friends that you haven't seen all week. We had no friends that we didn't see until we went to Trees for Tomorrow. <laughs> so we then had friends. So one of the things I've been trying to do as I notice somebody, so for instance, this morning we were upstairs and Mary did the voluntary greeting thing and set this person downstairs and <clears throat> I went, made sure I went over and talked to them to say, I'm so glad that you're here. And so I think that's one of the ways that we can grow our congregation is to make sure we go and say hi. So now the other thing I would remind people of is that some of us have retirement income and one of the ways we can use that without having to do tax, taxes on it is to give qualified charitable donations from our IRAs or whatever because you have to take out a certain amount every year based on what your salary, what your total was at the beginning of the year. And so I would urge people to think, go ahead make those contributions based on your required distribution. So, at any rate, yeah, yeah, so do I. So, thank you very much. My name is Renee Rice, and I'm a relative newcomer here. I've been here about 17 years, I think. <laughs> and uh, one of the things that I especially enjoy is hearing how many years some of you have been here, 30 and 40 plus, and what an amazing treasure that is to have in our congregation. I have been a part of lay ministry for the last 10 or so years and on the coordinating team. And you may not be familiar with the lay ministry program. What we do is we come to services and we are one of the many faces here for newcomers. And it's been my privilege as part of the coordinated team to collect the number of individuals and contacts that we make each month, each quarter, each year. And our lay ministry program talks to 10 to 15 percent of our congregation, which is a phenomenal amount. It is, it is such a joy to hear about the, the newcomers who come through our new UU program, who come to Blue Christmas, which was better attended this year than, than it ever has, although we've been doing it for many years. It was on a Saturday instead of a Tuesday, and that made all the difference. So I wanted to represent uh, our lay ministry program and, uh, and our, our mighty team who helps make everything go along with the rest of you. And I, and I want to um, express my 
profound gratitude for our dedicated, tireless, elected volunteers and staff who have spent countless hours creating a budget that is sustainable and based on years of congregational input. We continue to trust you to act for the greater good of our beloved congregation. And we have already seen, we've seen the benefits of these, of these um, conversations in that there are more volunteers. There are more, uh, there's more awareness of what it takes to make a congregation like ours happen every week, week after week. And what I have most noticed about being a lay minister is that people come here because of who we are together. Hello, I'm Dorit Bergen. Since we're playing the numbers game, I've been a member for 48 years, and, and therefore I'm kind of embarrassed to have to ask this question. Connie. The $198,000 that's in the budget that's going to come from the foundation in the proposed budget. So some of that money comes from different funds, and out of that money, a certain amount would have to go to music, would have to go to the building, whatever it's designated for. And then part of that is undesignated for the board to use as they want to. Thank you. That's all right. Hi, I'm Katie White. I am probably the newest member in the entire room. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> um, my family moved to Madison in March of 2020, right at the same time as COVID did. And uh, we've been coming to FUS as pretty much as soon as we could come back to FUS. Um, and I don't know when I just signed the membership book, but pretty soon thereafter. So I don't know, two years maybe only. Um, <laughs> And um, I've been in journey circles. I now sing in the choir. My kids go to CRE, um, trying to be involved and volunteer as much as I possibly can. Um, thank you to everyone who's been awesome and welcoming, and thanks to the board for all of your efforts. Um, that being said, I'm really concerned and unhappy with uh, several things um, in regard to this budget proposal. Can you give me a minute? <laughs> um, one of my daughters. Um, and I know you said that there was feedback from uh, the board and lots of back and forth, but it doesn't seem that there were a lot of feedback and back and forth with the congregation. <laughs> um, and I know there were town halls that we were invited to. I couldn't attend. I'm here today, even though I don't really have childcare, um, because I, this really matters to me. Um, and I know that you've said this, we're not acting on anything, the vote's in May, but it's a vote of yes or no. It's not, a, there hasn't been an involved process in like, hey, what, what do we think? <laughs> Is there an alternative? Do, are there other people that have ideas? I understand this is a problem, no question, but uh, are, are there other options? Um, and why haven't I been asked, like ever? Um, and, you know, like you said, oh, we're pretty sure that the religious, the CRE program and the music program will continue with the same quality and robustness. Did you ask Drew or Leslie? I'm curious. And if you did, what did they say? Did you ask the members of the choirs or the parents of the CRE program? What did they say? <laughs> Um, as members in both of those, I'd say, I don't think so. I don't think they will continue in the same way that they exist currently, and that's really important to me. And even more important to me, and one of the things that drew me to FUS was democracy. Uh, and I feel like this has not exactly been a democratic process. If there's a, a budget that's created by two people or three people, it's brought to a board, and there's some back and forth, and then here's the, here's the budget, the one budget, 
and we are just supposed to come and rubber stamp it in May. That doesn't feel good to me. <laughs> and so uh, that's, I guess, more of a comment than a question. Um, and I do have a petition um, in the interest of social justice and democracy. Um, if anybody's interested to come take a look at it and sign it, it's just asking as a caring, concerned congregation or member, as I am, um, asking the board to act now and provide an alternative budget proposal um, in a way that has more involvement and participation from the congregation and more closely follows a democratic process. Uh, sure. Well, I, I personally have a lot of ideas. So I'm a licensed psychologist. I also spent uh, six years in New York City working in the finance industry. Um, I don't have a professional credential, but I did work at an accounting firm and a hedge fund. And I'm guessing there are a lot of people here who have a lot of really great experience and knowledge and skills um, beyond what I have. So I think there are ideas of ways to increase the income, maybe make cuts if we really do have to. I understand there's a $200,000 deficit. I'm not, I, I'm not sure at this moment what I would cut, but I have some ideas about the process that we could go through to come up with some of those kinds of ideas. And I don't think, I'm not suggesting that one person or I would do that here and now, but you know, maybe there's a small group of congregants who could get together and come up with some other options. Real so. quick. Yeah, I wanted sure. to just say, I really appreciate you share, you know, speaking up. I know that's hard to do, but I did want to really uh, talk about the governance process. And I know we do have democratic processes, but we also have policy governance and the um, bylaws and our policy manuals on the website. So we don't have, you know, a thousand people come and do the budget. We, our process is that we have a finance committee. We have a board of directors elected by the congregation, um, and that happens in May. So we have democratic processes, but we don't have the congregation as a whole. We're all members of the congregation. Um, and so we have finance committee giving input. And this year we did have you know, quite a bit of discussion and um, transparency earlier in the year. But we are, we are governed by policy governance. Um, we can change our bylaws and our policies, but that's what we're governed by and that's what works for our church. And I do know, um, I, I do know these are really hard and there's, you know, I have kids in RE too. Um, it, it, it's very challenging, but we do have to make cuts and we are all here to make uh, fiduciary uh, recommendations and, um, and it's just the, how, how we govern ourselves. So I did wanna make that clear, I know it's, it can say, you can say it, it doesn't feel democratic. There's democratic processes, but we have policy governance. But even, even the democratic process that you mentioned, which is electing the board of directors, doesn't seem democratic to me. Because a year, or more than a year ago, there was a blurb in the red floors about, would you like to serve as a board of trustee? Email this person. And I did. And I got a call. And I spoke to the person. And I learned that, essentially, <laughs> I can't show up at the meeting and say, I'd like to be a board member. Here's who I am, what I think and you could vote. No, there's a nominations committee, and if you're not in with the nominations committee, then you're not going to be nominated at the May meeting to be voted on. And so, sorry, but you can't, I was told no, which, <laughs> again, is frustrating and doesn't actually seem democratic. Too. So, I, I understand that, but yeah, I, I don't know. I there, there are a number, you know, you talk about welcoming new members, which is really important, but you've also got to keep the new ones that you get. And I'm not the only one in conversation since this has all come about who has felt like something's kind of broken and could be improved and the pe people are, do leave and consider leaving. And so I think it's kind of important, not just to like give me the, you know, official uh, word about governance, but like may maybe we do something different this time. Um, so, sorry, that's all. I'll see. I'll stop monopolizing the microphone. <laughs> yeah, I again just want to express so much appreciation for you voicing your concerns. Um, and I'm sure any number of us have some issues, small or large, with the way that we currently do things here. Um, and there are ways to change the ways that we do things here. Um, 
it's not going to happen just by kind of making a comment or two in a forum. Um, there are processes laid out in the bylaws, which I strongly encourage you all to go look at. That is part of our democratic, uh, our democratic processes as well. Um, a couple comments I wanted to make, kind of regardless of the, of the larger system, but with this specific situation in mind, in thinking about, um, well, so first of all, everything that I've heard from my fellow board members is that we are listening to the feedback of the congregation and considering it. Um, and, you know, it, it is possible for our minds to be changed in some way um, to change the budget that we put before you in May. Um, are we necessarily going to make every change we are asked to? No, and we have some very good reasons why we might not, but we are listening. And if you don't feel like we're listening to you, come talk to us in a, in a different setting because we really do want to hear from you. Um, the uh, comment I wanted to make about this specific situation is there's a really big impact to our staff, to the people who are in those positions that we are talking about making cuts to. And the idea of presenting a few different options um, for what our budget could be effectively would look like which staff members are we going to cut. We could cut person A and B, we could cut person B and C, and that doesn't feel like a good way to treat our staff. So something we've tried to be really cognizant of throughout this process is treating our staff with integrity. Um, giving them as much notice as we can about what the situation is going to be and taking care of them to the extent that we can through this tumultuous process. Um, and I don't think presenting options in that way would look like treating them with integrity. So I did want to mention that specific of this situation as well. Also to follow up with what Katie said, it is Katie, right? I loved singing next to her during All Music Sunday. Um, I was on the nominations committee for a while, and Katie, if you had come to me and said, I want to be on the board, your name would have been on it, because we're always looking for people who want to do the work around here. So I don't know what, how that process broke down, but I... I really do think that it's true that the board is listening to us and that it is as democratic as it can be within the policy governance that we have decided to follow. However, I do think this is a forum where we need to be saying, I disagree with this budget. And I do, I disagree with this budget. I disagree with this budget in many of the same ways as Katie does. I think losing Drew Collins would be a major blow to our congregation, not just to the music program, but to the whole congregation. Drew is a remarkable musician. He has done amazing things with our choirs, and I think that a halftime position is not sufficient for what he needs because he has two small children and a wife to support. And I think that this would be terrible to lose him. So my suggestion is to increase his position to 100%. Yeah, I just want to say that I don't want to lose any of our staff. I really don't. Um, but I don't want this to turn into a popularity contest. I don't want this to turn into a popularity contest. And I'm really sensitive to that, that the staff is going through so much with these cuts. And we have kept the personal out of it as much as we possibly can in defining specific jobs that the church needs and then fitting people to those jobs. So. Hi. 
My name's Ann Fleming. I am um, a member of the Healthy Congregations team. My wife, Carolyn, and I have been members here for about 14 years. We raised our two daughters here, who are now adults. And I have um, the experience of having spent the first part of my career, the first 10 and a half years, working in a professional ministry capacity in another tradition. And I echo what Susan, or what Susan Koenig, right, had said that, um, it's exhilarating work to work for a congregation. It is also crazy-making to work for a church. And part of the reason for that, and I think one thing that we need to be cognizant of here, is that what kind of employer do we want to be? We want to be an employer, but we want to be a just employer. And we've recognized in this budget that for years we have underpaid a large staff. And working now in social work, jobs that don't provide a living wage are stressful. They are hard jobs to live in. They are hard jobs to support your family for lots of reasons. All you think about is money. Is that the kind of employer that we want to be? Or do we want to have a smaller staff that we can justly pay? My name is Tim Conroy. I've been a member here for 10 years and was on the, finan uh, excuse me, the personnel committee for um, many, many years. I, I just want to say that the, um, everyone here cares about the congregation because we're taking time out of our day to be here, which is, which is great. And our board cares a lot. They're volunteers. And um, it's a lot of work. And I, I want to say I, I support this budget. It's the best we can do. Nonprofits and for-profits, your biggest expense is usually your people. And that makes it really hard. And um, we're doing all we can. Um, our revenue comes from us, from pledges. And that's really where we have to start. And if we can't get more members and more pledges, then we have to make cuts, and we're doing the right thing right now. Hi, I'm Karen Medioni, and um, I really appreciate Katie's um, talk because I think that... Um, the music program is not just something that affects some people, it affects everybody here. And Drew is absolutely critical to that program and he can't afford a mortgage and a family on a half-time salary. So we will probably lose him. And then what are we gonna do? We're gonna go out and recruit another music director for a half-time position? I don't think so. Um, I don't know if uh, you probably watched the uh, PBS NewsHour, and uh, they had something that talked about people singing individually and people singing in choruses. And when people sang in choruses, not only did they have much improvements in health and attitude and everything, but they were more generous. <laughs> and I can tell you that since I joined the choir, you know, um, I had a limiting factor, which was my husband and how much he thought uh, I should donate. But once he was out of the way, um, <laughs> not only has it increased, but I used that required minimum distribution to give a heck of a lot more money here. And quite frankly, I've got a required minimum distribution for this year too. Now I'm not only taking the one from my inherited inherited one, I've got one of my own that has to be taken. And I would like to know that that money is being used where my heart is, which is the music program. And I have given things, and in one case, somebody actually called me and said they couldn't take my donation because I put music program on it. Now I've been sending the RMDs um, from my brokerage firm, which says for the music program, I want to know how does that get credited and can that be used to be able to save half a position? I appreciate your answer. All right, so. Um, I want to try and answer this question as fulsomely as I can. You have a number of options when you decide that you want to share your wealth with the congregation. One of the ways you can do that is through an annual pledge. Your annual pledge goes into the same pot of money 
that the, that the congregation uh, that is, that is uh, determined by the congregation how it will be distributed when the congregation votes or does not. You have the right to vote the budget down. If you don't like it, it is possible for you to do that. It's a real option. I'm not trying to hide that from you. You can vote the budget down. That is part of our democratic process, right? The congregation votes on the budget each year. The pool of money that we, uh, that we determine for that is largely, I already said, more than half of it is our pledged incomes. There's the money that comes to us from our members' pledges does not come with conditions or earmarks attached to it. It's determined by what the congregation decides when it votes on the budget each year. You have other options, things to give. Connie can speak to you in detail about ways in which you can contribute to the foundation. There are existing funds in the foundation that are earmarked for certain specific purposes. And if you like those purposes well enough and you want to make a, contrib a contribution that may have a longer term impact to, on the congregation and less focused on one year, the current years, or the current coming years, uh, budgeting, then the foundation are the people to talk to. And I, I know that Connie is ready to have that conversation with you and I encourage you to follow up with her. If you, if you either uh, find that you don't, none of the funds that currently exist with the foundation that have special uh, controls on where the money can and can't be spent, if you find that you don't like any of those, you have something more specific or something different in mind, you can also start a new fund. There's a minimum amount of money that it takes to start a new fund, but that's a thing that a person or a group of people can do. You can talk to Connie about starting a new fund, how the restrictions work. And then the final thing, I think it's the final thing, it's the last thing I can think of, is that you can also make a donation to the congregation with whatever restrictions on it you want. You can say, we can only use it to buy purple elephants. Recognize I'm being facetious here, but that's as narrow as you can get. You, you can be as specific as you want. However, by policy, anything, any gift that's like a one-time gift for this or like next year's budget that's not a gift to the foundation, any gift like that, whatever restrictions the donor wants to make on it, they can make, but it has to be approved by the board. It has to be accepted by the board in order to do that. And so if you want to make a specific gift for a specific purpose, please come talk to the board. They are ready to have that conversation with you. I think you've answered part of the question, but maybe I should ask staff about this because where did that money go that I put music program on the check and you cashed it? So, so yeah. Karen, I'll be really happy to follow. I, this is the first time I'm aware of this question. I will this be very has happy happened. To... A lot of people have brought this oh, up. Okay. I, I'm I not believe, the only one. I believe you, and I will follow up with you about it, but I don't have an answer for you in this moment. I'm Donna Beesman, and my husband and I have been members for four months. <laughs> <laughs> We have been active church members in another tradition for 50 or 60 years, but we've had questions, and it's a theological dilemma that brought us here, and we have found this to be a warm and welcoming congregation. I've described others that we have found that it's both spiritually and intellectually meaningful to us at this stage in our life, so thank you. Um, but I think also one of all, almost all churches are struggling with the same dilemma. It's not new here. Um, but I wish that the greater Madison area could somehow approach others who are questioning their traditional religious um, tradition that that's no, no longer maybe rings true. Um, and I wish we could somehow get this message out that, that we hear every Sunday here, that we question boldly, listen humbly, grow spiritually, and act courageously in love unapologetic, unapologetically. I think that is very powerful, and I think there must be hundreds of people who would be attracted to this, to coming in to visit if they knew this phrase. I think um, we'll probably just take one more question, maybe someone who we haven't heard from, if that's okay. Um, and then we'll wrap up because it's almost two and we do want to be respectful of everyone's time. So one more question. 
Uh, hi, I'm Terry, and I uh, just wanted to thank the board for all the work that's gone into communicating this um, budget so carefully, um, for all the extra meetings and everything. Um, for those of us who still are wondering <laughs> at the end of these meetings, um, what can I do? Um, I wonder if the board members could kind of share, if you kind of, kind of have a short list of the things that you're especially hoping to see from the congregation as we work through these changes. And thank you for sitting up front. <laughs> thank you, Terry. Uh, so you can email me, fusprez at gmail.com. That is linked on the website. We also meet monthly if you want to come talk to the board. Please contact us first so we can have an agenda item for you. Um, but you can always just come and, and sit into a board meeting as well. And then as far as if there's something that you do want to get the word out for engagement or um, membership engagement or uh, stewardship, we are, as I said, organizing those ministry teams. And you can contact our staff over here <laughs> um, if you are interested in, in doing that. And, and, you know, especially if you have an idea or there's a way that you want to do it. I know everyone's different gifts are, are welcome. Um, and what else, anything else that folks wanted to say of ways that you want to? Uh, also, a shout out for our FAQ document. I yeah. think it's the second to last question is exactly this. Uh, so a couple of the other things we put in our answer to the FAQ. Um, other important opportunities are uh, supporting our worship services by being an usher, a greeter, or a hospitality person, making the coffee. That Those roles really contribute to the experience of newcomers, making sure they feel welcome, as well as the existing members. Um, and the social justice and religious exploration programs, as we mentioned earlier, are particularly impacted by the staff cuts. And so in order to continue programming there the way we have come to know it, um, we'll certainly need increased volunteer support there as well. Um, I also know that Kelly Cracker mentioned at a couple of the previous town halls that um, in response to some of this news, a couple members of the congregation had reached out to her saying, I've got two hours a week or four hours a month and I wanna support the staff, how can I do that? And those offers are also appreciated. Does that cover it? Yes, thank you. Thank you, good reminder. So I do wanna really thank everybody. We are listening to you. We wanna hear your feedback. Again, we can't, um, we can't make all the changes, so I hope that you're understanding if we can't make the changes that you are suggesting, but we are hearing you, and we do really appreciate your time. And I want to very much thank the board and the finance committee because it's, it's a lot of hours of work for these folks, unpaid, you know, so really appreciate the board's time too, so appreciate that. So thank you, and... We'll wrap up with our closing reading from Kelly. Thank you. Yeah, so this, uh, this reading comes from Kaki McTeek. What question do you think you need answered in order to wake to the morning and step into your life with joy? Listen. The dark branches scrolled sharp against a pure sky are the only map you will ever receive. When you look at those lines... When you attend to them until you feel yourself lifted by their dark runes into the clear winter sun or the dimming light of evening, there is your guide. When gratitude rises as the only prayer of your heart, you are learning at last what it is to be fully alive. Thanks, friends. <laughs>